Thank you for tuning into our podcast, History's Top 3, brought to you by the History Department of the United States Naval Academy, located in Annapolis, Maryland. In this show, we will discuss and debate some of the key turning points, trends, and major figures of world history. Our goal is to explore the varied landscapes and seascapes of the past, in the hopes of shedding some light on the way the present world came to be. In our studio today are our three co-hosts, Lieutenant Terrence Viernes, Professor Courtney Spikes, and myself, Captain Bob Q. All of us are instructors and lifelong students of history. In this new season of the Top 3, each of us will present our top choice for today's theme. We will then discuss how we made our choices and why we believe they deserve a place in the Top 3. We invite you to share your thoughts and engage in the discussion. Today, we will be discussing the Top 3 Most Consequential Natural Disasters, and I will actually be kicking us off today. My choice is the crisis of the 14th century, which was a comprehensive political, social, and religious disaster in Europe, but the core of this is actually a cluster of natural disasters. The most famous, of course, was the Black Death, but less well known is that there was a broader climate crisis starting in 1315, resulting in the worst famine in European history. It was a year of unusually cold and wet weather. The spring rains began in 1315 and didn't really stop. They were followed by a cold winter, even more rain in 1316. At one point, there's 150 days of continuous rain. Grain rots in the field, animals die. Maybe something like 10 to 25% of the population of Europe dies of starvation. Uh, One quote says, a great famine of dearth with such mortality that the living could scarce suffice to bury the dead. Horse flesh and dog's flesh was accounted good meat, and some eat their own children. Okay, that's disgusting. It's unclear why this uh, happened. Uh, One possible theory is that there was a volcano, Mount Tarawera, that erupted near New Zealand. But this was extremely consequential, in part because of the links to the Black Death. Uh, Even though the food supply had somewhat stabilized by the 1320s, you had a generation of people, particularly children, whose health was permanently crippled because of malnutrition. That's part of the reason why the Black Death, which arrives in 1347, is as bad as it actually is. Uh, The plague is attacking people whose immune systems are already weakened. And there's also an interesting cultural legacy of the famine. One example is the story of Hansel and Gretel. Uh, This is a story of children who are abandoned in the woods and encounter someone who is trying to eat them. Uh, Some people think this is a legacy of the Great Famine that's eventually passed down in Germany through oral histories. And both the famine and the later plague cause a lot of social unrest. There's peasant revolts, there's social and religious upheaval. It really causes a comprehensive challenge to all of the political and social structures in the Middle Ages. This is when you get things like the Hundred Years' War, uh, the Great Schism of the Church. The crisis of the 14th century really ends the Middle Ages and the whole medieval era and brings us to what we now know as the early modern period. That's why this is my choice for one of the top three consequential natural disasters. That's wild to hear about a climate crisis that far back. You know, like like, that was very sophisticated knowledge, a sophisticated methodology to figure out that that even happened in the first place. Um, But my question really here is how you mentioned that this event has a lot of social and religious and political consequences resulting in a lot of upheaval. But how did the everyday person? How did the average peasant uh, deal with this crisis? Well, mostly they died. <laughs> I, I don't know. You, you, could, you could probably cut that. That's a little bit blunt. Um, no, I'm gonna, That's I'm gonna, the I'm, truth. Yeah. Uh, uh, like many crises, it, it at first affects people differently. If you are wealthier or you're in a better position, uh, you can handle things like famine and crisis better. Although this does become something that affects every aspect of society. There's a story about how the king of England is passing through a town and he finds that there's no food, even for the king, right? But in addition to this aspect of how differently and unevenly it at first affects different people, uh, there are some commonalities in how they react to it. Uh, They tend to view this as shaking their faith in things they may have previously believed. So there's some questioning of religious doctrine. There's some questioning of even political and ideological doctrine about what gives a ruler a right to rule. I think that's really interesting, Bob, because... You know, when you have um, pandemics impacting all levels of society, 
when, you know, you've been trained, if you're a peasant or, or you know, working um, for someone, that the people that are higher in rank of you, which is totally, you know, socially manufactured here, but those that are higher rank, you're believed to be that they are chosen by God to be above you. And here we have something, a pandemic maybe coming from God or elsewhere, that is now ravaging people across all social levels. So it's not surprising that suddenly they were question what they're supposed to believe. Are the meek to inherit the earth or those that survive? You're absolutely right. I think you nailed this question of all of these things that you may have previously assumed to be true around the world have been called into question. So what else should you question, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I'm curious. I'm going to bring it to the present day. Do you see any parallels on the impact of human and daily life from this era's event to today? That's a great question. One of the really interesting theories is that this crisis sort of loosens the bonds of feudalism. Uh, this whole labor system where you had serfs and lords, it, it changes because, first of all, many of the serfs die, and it causes people to really rethink this whole system, uh, a whole rethinking of the relationships between labor and society. And obviously, COVID-19 was not nearly as bad as the Black Death, but it's kind of funny because you see similar rethinkings of the relationships of labor and society. Right. Uh, even little things like working from home, it causes us to think about, uh, reconfigure these ways that we live of our lives. Absolutely. Courtney, I actually think your choice is also very interesting. Would you like to go next? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, hey guys, I've got a little bit of a brain teaser for you and our listeners. So how do these different items relate to one another? The gothic novel Frankenstein, 20 inches of snow in New England in June, the invention of the bicycle, the cholera pandemic in South Asia, the Western migration of the United States, 142 days of rain in Ireland, and J.M.W. Turner's vivid paintings of sunsets. And in the words of Lord Byron, one of the most scandalous authors of the Romantic era, his words from the poem Darkness, I had a dream, which was not at all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished, and the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. Morn came and went, and came and brought no day, and men forgot their passions in the dread of this, their desolation. What does this all have in common? Well, my friends, it is the infamous year without a summer in 1816, which really lasted through 1818. So how do we get here? Well, on April 5th, 1815, Mount Tambora, located on the island of Sumbawa in what we now call Indonesia, violently erupted, throwing, get this, 150 cubic kilometers of debris into the air. Okay, so that's enough to cover the entirety of the UK knee deep in ash. This blast was 100 times more powerful than the eruption of Washington State's Mount St. Helens in 1980 and 1,000 times more powerful than the Icelandic eruption of 2010. Now, volcanists who study volcanoes technically label Tambora's eruption as, quote, colossal, and it measured as high as seven on the magnitude scale of thermal energy. Well, let's just say debris, ash, and smoke was so thick, it plunged the surrounding areas into two days of complete darkness. In an instant, 10,000 on the island of Sambawa were killed, and the surrounding islands had at least 90,000 people die, some within days, while many others died from starvation, with the lack of crops or animals available and most of their water completely contaminated. And it was not just the debris that made the eruption of Mount Tambora so deadly. The volcano also released gases like sulfur dioxide so forcefully into the air that it reached the stratosphere, where it eventually converted into sulfuric acid. So these tiny acid aerosols now spread out across the stratosphere, primarily in the northern hemisphere, and these droplets acted as reflectors against the sun's rays, which meant that less energy from the sun was able to reach the Earth's surface. In a nutshell... There was a long-term cooling effect that occurred across all of the Northern Hemisphere. And, you know, climatologists today explain that this anomaly remained in the stratosphere for more than two years, resulting in a drop in the overall temperature by one degree Celsius, which I guess doesn't sound like a lot, but it had significant repercussions. So what did this mean for the everyday lives of people like you and me? Well, it wasn't too good. It was recorded in New England, a place used to getting a lot of snow. It was reported that in June, the first month of summer, snow fell for 20 
inches just to kick off the summer that year. And as you know, America's great westward expansion began around 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase, but historians say it really kicked off in earnest in 1816 as farmers from the original 13 colonies were enticed to seek farmland elsewhere after the devastating effects of that summer. And Americans nicknamed the year. So instead of saying 1816, they would say 1800 and froze to death. Ireland had its rainiest summer on record with continuous rain for straight eight weeks. Between May and September of 1816, it rained 142 out of 153 days on the Green Isle. And 1816 is also the only year in recorded history where trees showed zero growth. You know how trees have rings when you cut it across the trunk and you can count it? Well, 1816's tree ring is completely missing. In Asia, two major problems arose. Some historians argue that the food shortages caused by Mount Tambora's eruption and the changes to the atmosphere created political instability, which in turn helped the British to more firmly establish their opium trade in China. And in South Asia, the first cholera pandemic, meaning it occurred across multiple countries, beginning in Bengal, spreading to India, eventually across to China, and then back to Indochina, where Mount Tambora initiated this climate anomaly, and then all the way to the Caspian Sea in Eastern Europe, ending in 1824. So I know this all sounds really terrible, and it really was, but there's also some interesting things that resulted from this year without a summer. The crop failures of 1816 also meant there was not enough to feed the horses. So an intrepid German, Karl van Dries, designed a new method of transport, the Die Laufsmaschine, please excuse my German pronunciation, which was actually an early form of the bicycle. It had two wheels and a seat, but no pedals. And a group of romantics, Mary Shelley, Lord Byron, and others, tried to escape to Lake Geneva, but they found it so depressing that they actually held a contest to see who could write the scariest ghost story. And from that, we get Byron's famous poem, Darkness, which I quoted at the start, and Shelley wrote the world-renowned gothic novel, Frankenstein. It's crazy to think how that climate crisis or that volcanic eruption can result in such manifest and widespread impacts from culture to art and even, you know, the birth of socialism, I suppose, right? One could say an early uh, concept of it. So my question here is the connection with Napoleon. We're Mm. coming off of the Napoleonic War, especially in 1815 when he's finally exiled to St. Helena for good, right? And... The Europeans are trying to pick up the pieces of the mess he left behind. So as they're doing that and this uh, volcanic eruption happens, how are they balancing this? How are they dealing with the ramifications of this crisis? Great question, Terrence. Great question. So as you said, Europe was coming off of 25 years of war and revolution initiated by the French Revolution in 1789 and the European Wars in 1793. These are going to end finally once and for all at the Battle of Waterloo in June of 1815. And Napoleon, as you rightly said, is exiled finally to St. Helena, and he's not coming back. But unemployment was actually at an all-time high as a result of these wars. And governments were struggling to transition from war manufacturing back to international trade. And the political tensions between the new revolutionary ideas that Napoleon had tried to spread and the traditional conservative politicians seeking a return to the old order would remain in you know, contest, remain in conflict for years to come. I mean, you've got Metternich trying to do the Congress in Vienna, but that's going to fail because all the members have different ideas of how they want to move forward in the world. Ironically, the harvest of 1815 actually had been pretty good. But the climate change resulting from Mount Tambora across the Northern Hemisphere had really decreased the length of the growing season for 1816. And and the frost and snow that summer just ravaged the crops that had survived. So, you know, governments were struggling to figure out, how do I just feed our population? I mean, it was a really hard time for them. That's a great discussion of the consequences of, of this disaster. Terrence, I believe your choice also has some very direct local consequences. What disaster did you choose? Well, 
I chose the Great Kanto Earthquake of 1923 in Japan, in keeping with, you know, me being a huge fanboy of Japan. (laughs) (laughs) We welcome it. We welcome it. Yeah, right? And in order to understand why this is so consequential, it's important to lay down why or what Japan was like prior to the earthquake. And Japan is coming off of this massive boom period that they experienced during World War I. And, you know, the retraction in the economy resulted in a little bit of instability in their markets and problems, domestic problems at home. Also, on top of that, despite the you know, market instability, the Taisho democracy, the the political environment in Japan was actually taking a very liberal turn, as in they're westernizing even more so. They are embracing the model that the United States is following, plurality and freedom of expression, things of that nature. And so Japan in the early 1920s is starting to look like some of the more metropolitan areas of the United States or even Europe. This spirit of liberalization was spreading across the country. There were popular campaigns to expand voting rights to all eligible men and women, uh, in addition to promoting workers' rights. And art and literature reflected the avant-garde trends seen in Europe. So Japan's future was looking pretty bright. But on September 1st, 1923, at 11.58 a.m., so two minutes before noon, right as people are having lunch, Japan is hit by this magnitude 7.9 earthquake. Oh, my goodness. For comparison, let's look at the, the Fukushima earthquake that happened in very recent memory. And that was a 7.4 magnitude earthquake with its epicenter that's about 30 miles east of the closest Japanese coast. So it is an offshore earthquake. And it still you know, caused a significant amount of damage. But this earthquake... In 1923, 7.9 magnitude, its epicenter was 40 miles southwest of Tokyo on land. Wow. And so you can only imagine how absolutely devastating this damage was. In Yokohama, one of the closest metropolises in Tokyo, uh, 90% of the homes are destroyed. Right? And an American writer at the time, Henry Kinney, the editor of the Trans-Pacific Magazine, wrote that Yokohama, the city of almost half a million souls, had become a vast plain of fire, devouring sheets of flame which played and flickered. Here and there, a remnant of a building, a few shattered walls, stood up like rocks above the expanse of flame, unrecognizable. The city was gone. In Tokyo, 60% of the population is now rendered homeless, and Tokyo is the site of what has become known as the Dragon Twister of Honjo. Dragon Twister? Yeah, it sounds super cool, right? But it, <laughs> but it's, it's really not. It's actually really awful. <laughs> because this is a fire tornado, a fire tornado that ripped through the Honjo district. The Dragon Twister of Honjo was formed by this firestorm on the ground, rapidly heating up the air above it, causing that to pull in even more of the surrounding air. And so you now have these hurricane force winds. This Dragon Twister is estimated to have been 650 feet tall, almost 1,000 feet wide, and had a spinning velocity of 125 miles per hour. And so this claimed 40,000 lives in less than 15 minutes from the resulting wow. firestorm. 40,000. Yes. It's insane. The numbers are, are wild. And a lot of the survivor accounts from the time read like narratives from a post-apocalyptic movie. Think of any Hollywood production, really. That's quite literally what they were seeing. And some Japanese saw this as divine punishment for their sinful ways, for leaving behind their traditions in favor of Western culture. Among these were extreme and racially motivated violence against Koreans living in the metropolises. You know, recall that Korea was absorbed into the Japanese Empire in 1910 and that some migration into Japan's main cities uh, has been happening ever since. So about 6,000 Koreans were made into scapegoats and murdered by these marauding bands of vengeful and frustrated Japanese called uh, Jikedan. Right? These people were motivated by anger, uh, of course, what had just happened, but also because of widespread rumors that Korean subversives were looking to overthrow the government and were soon ready to act. Right? But none of that, of course, panned out. Despite these terrible stories, there's some feel-good narratives to come out of this. There's the story of the mayor of Meguro, Soda Tetsuo. He refused demands from local GK Dun to turn over a handful of Korean domestics, about six of them, who worked for him. The ensuing standoff resulted in him promising to give up his life 
if any one of the Koreans in his care were found to be responsible for the fires that destroyed Tokyo. Once this immediate crisis was resolved, Tetsuo began finding more people to protect and save, eventually housing nearly a thousand Koreans in a horse track stadium converted into a makeshift refugee camp. Their survival was guaranteed by Tetsuo's belief in their innocence. And I think that's really inspiring. This really has the long-term consequence of having a very expensive reconstruction period. And it's these costs that partially contribute to Japan's financial vulnerability and instability as soon as the Great Depression hit. Right? They were already having a bit of instability in the 20s. This made it worse. And so when the Depression kicks in after the stock market crash of 1929, everything falls apart. Right? And because everything did end up falling apart, Japan slides that much more easily towards extreme nationalism and militarism and sets us up for World War II. Terrence, this is such an interesting period in Japanese history. It's a country that really seems caught between the past and the future uh, and traditional Japanese culture and the West. And in some ways, this is the same tension to the extent that modernization equals westernization. How does this tension impact the rebuilding and the recovery from the disaster? As far as rebuilding goes, a lot of the documents I was able to pull up for this reflects this idea that emergency response needs to be part of city design which I think is pretty cool. They do continue to build in both the modern way of concrete buildings and you know larger structures that can be supported by steel, but they also continue to build in the traditional Japanese method of wood and paper and uh, a lot of these traditional construction materials. But what's new in this new vision of Tokyo is a greater range of public parks or essentially places where people can take refuge from fires, from earthquakes, so things aren't falling on them, right? That becomes part of the city DNA of places like Tokyo and Yokohama. You can still see that today, for sure. Uh, but I, I think, personally, the, the, the greatest achievement here is just the, the country still willing to preserve and maintain these old structures throughout the cities, like shrines especially, right? If you walk through Tokyo and Yokohama today, you will still see these big uh, these shrines big and small littered throughout and they've just built around them that's amazing terrence and uh, you know it's so interesting to see how urban planning shifted as a result of this and your shrine comment leads me to my question i'm curious how the victims of this event because there were so many different types of events happening at the same time from you know the fire dragon to the earthquake and etc how are the victims of this event remembered or honored in japan today Specifically for the victims of the fire dragon, there is a shrine dedicated to them and you know the remains that could be collected for the 40,000 victims. Right? They're housed in this one big shrine in Tokyo, which I unfortunately haven't had the opportunity to see, but if I get a chance to go back to Japan, this is definitely on the to-go list. Pretty high on it. I'm glad to hear that they're um, still remembered and honored. And, you know, this seems like such a significant event that you described so well in terms of the political shift from liberal to conservative. And I just wondered if it's widely featured in the Japanese narrative of their rise in the 20th century. So to that, I would say that this event is seen more as a transformative event, maybe not something that is um, a direct link direct cause to their slide into militarism but it is one of those bricks along that path that led them there right but it is also something that's commemorated annually it is seen as kind of a national safety day but it's something that doesn't gain an awful lot of attention in western circles it's not something discussed in our history classes uh for example because i don't think it's something that directly impacts us per se it is something that is burned into the psyche of Japan, especially this uh, modern 20th century Japan, but not so much the modern 20th century America. Good point. What was interesting to me when I was learning about natural disasters and doing research is how often I thought, wow, this disaster is super important. How come more people do not know about this? Do you all think we have a blind spot about natural disasters when it comes to history? I think I think we might. I mean, I think historians traditionally focus on the notion of agency and this narrative of overcoming the disaster. 
even if we took the historians out of the picture, I think audiences or the general public themselves have an, a bias towards agency, a bias towards what people do, right? Because, yeah, sure, a, an absolutely massive, devastating earthquake could have happened in the period of the dinosaurs, but so what? There was nobody there, <laughs> right? There was nobody there to, to write Poor it down. Or T-Rex. Yeah, or, or live <laughs> through it or make a documentary about it or things of that nature. But when it comes to things like the, the fire tornado, or sorry, the, the fire dragon, or when it comes to the year without a summer, there's a lot of people that are impacted by this, and they make art, they make shrines, they write stuff down. Right? And so people are drawn to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right, because history really is a story of human agency. And where agency comes in is how we respond to the natural disasters. So, you know, there is this whole question of uh, agency being how we respond to the disasters. So what does it mean for a disaster to be consequential? For example, Courtney, I know that you were actually on the fence between two different disasters. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah, it was so interesting. So I ended up picking... Um, Tambora, because I felt like it had larger consequences across multiple nations. Um, really, the northern hemisphere, I wrote, the southern hemisphere wasn't as impacted. But I was initially going to look at um, the volcano Laki that um, erupted in Iceland, you know, June of 1783 to about February of 1784. And it really impacted uh, sort of Western Europe and many believe helped cause the um, tensions and issues uh, just prior to the French Revolution. If you compare Lockheed to Tambora, Tambora was rated a four, I'm sorry, Tambora was rated a seven on the scale, where Lockheed's only rated a four. But it did still produce about 120 million tons of sulfuric dioxide, right? That's the dioxide that's going to get transformed into the stratosphere and reflect the sun or cause what they called the Lockheed haze during this time period and led to many, many failed harvests, especially in 1785. And of course, in 1789, we actually have the French Revolution. That's so interesting because you have, on the one hand, a larger volcanic eruption, but then another one with these very distinct political dynamics. And so I think this question of consequences, especially for us as historians, is one that we can disagree on, right? What exactly does it mean to be consequential? Do we mean just direct political consequences? Is there a cultural legacy, uh, like you talked about with Frankenstein and Lord Byron? Right. Uh, it's a really interesting subject, especially when we talk to these dis- about these disasters, which we all know can be extremely consequential in very different ways. And while there's plenty more to debate on this subject, we'll save that for a round of drinks between friends. From all of us here at the U.S. Naval Academy, particularly at the History Department, thank you for tuning in. This has been a production of the History Department at the U.S. Naval Academy, located in Annapolis, Maryland. If you enjoy our programs, please let us know as we'd love to hear your thoughts. You can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at USNA History. And our email is historyproductions-group at usna.edu. For more information about the History Department at the Naval Academy, please visit usna.edu history.